<coughs> the, uh, for this subject, we're going to U.S. poverty. So you, you see what I, the strategy here is, we had an intro lecture, right? Then we did two, day, two lectures on Guatemala, a movie, and then contacts and various issues in Guatemala, okay? And then we went to the big picture from a distance, you know, uh, the big data that's it's not, you're not gonna get real emotional about, but it's, it's somewhat, it's hard to wrap your mind about around. So we, we did that the last class period. Today we're gonna do an, what you may view as an unusual thing is we're gonna go to the, what most people think of as the richest country in the world, the United States, and we're gonna talk about poverty in the United States. Now, what I think is, why I think this is good, is number one, people from other countries, I think don't typically understand the poverty problem in the United States, number one. Number two, most US people don't understand the poverty problem in the United States. Most now, there's plenty of you that might, okay, um, and um, I think it's it's nice too because when you look at this, you say you should be thinking, um, oh, well, the richest country in the world has a, these kind of issues still. It must be the case that these issues are everywhere, every country, okay, to some extent. Now, there may be there, there are rich countries that have a lot fewer problems than we have. Okay, there's no question about that. Some in Europe, for instance, we'll be identifying and discussing some of that. Okay, so that's the objective today is uh, to talk about um, U.S. poverty for, okay, so now I've got, I've got Guatemala for context and we've got U.S. for context and we've got the world context. Okay, um, with respect to the U.S., um, I am not going to show these videos, but uh, these videos are from Invisible People TV. Um, and... Uh, most people in the United States think of the homeless in the United States as being, you know, the, the worse off in many ways. Um, and these videos um, are interviews of homeless people, mostly from the U.S., a few that you can see there from Canada. Um, what's inter I, I'm not going to um, look at them now. We can talk about them after class, but I'd say they're interesting videos. And uh, last year we did look at some in class and, uh, and we got actually a pretty heated argument going in class and one woman started crying and I mean it was, it's, it's not, these aren't simple things, okay? Um, there, and, and what's interesting is, is, is I found, find that U.S. people are not as sympathetic to these people sometimes, some, some U.S. people. And, uh, but others are very sympathetic. It's, it's very mixed, okay? Um, and, and I, I think, I don't know if it's a general trend, but I don't know if we have a tendency for our own country to be less sympathetic for people in our own country versus another country. And maybe that's a principle. I don't know. <coughs> I'd like to maybe discuss that, you know, um, over a drink tonight. But um, these I leave on here, and these are linked to in the book, and these are the ones we're going to pick from after class to discuss. And then I'm just going to go on, okay? So we're going to talk about homelessness from a distance. So what are the subpopulation, the trends, and causes? And I want to focus on misperceptions about homelessness in the United States. Some things you'd be like, you're kidding me, okay? So the first thing is the proportion of the homeless uh, populations, 2012, it's hardly changed since then. So um, first thing is, this mediocre um, color of blue, it's a chronic, is normally defined as one year of homelessness or longer, okay? It's only 15.8%. Most people in the United States think that everybody that's homeless is chronically homeless, okay? It's not the case. This is the one that really surprises people, people and families. So almost 40% of our homeless are families. They're in families, they have their kids with them, okay? There's a man and woman homeless. There's a, a woman with her children. That's a very common case, by the way. You get divorced, you kick the wife and kids out, and they're homeless. Okay, this happens all the time. Um, and then, then you have uh, non-chronic. Okay, so these are people that, for instance, lose their jobs, can't pay rent, and they're homeless. This is, they're evicted. Okay, this is happening all the time. All right, next. Now these subpopulations here, the first one is the overall, so it's 633,782, so 634,000 homeless in the United States, okay, for contacts, uh, 
320 million people in the United States um, by U.S. Um, Census Bureau um, <coughs> clock. Um, on the right side, you have sheltered versus unsheltered. Okay, so the way this is defined is 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 you know they might be in a homeless shelter, um, for instance. Unsheltered would mean living in a tent by the river. Um, and there's individuals. Okay, but then there's families, family households, whole family household out on the street, veterans. Okay. Um, this a lot of people are upset about, but it's the lowest sub percentage of all of them. And then, well, you know, the chronic, almost 100,000 uh, chronically homeless people. Um, now, I know this is a little dense, but I'm just going to pick off certain parts. Um, this table is, um, is really fascinating. Um, so what I'm going to do is ignore, this is for clients in, in homeless families and single homeless clients. Let's just ignore that data. I want to just look at this column right here. Out of all homeless with an N of 2938. They interviewed almost 3,000 people to come up with this data. So their mean monthly income is $367. Okay, but here's what's interesting. Go to A, footnote. A, the standard deviations for the three mean incomes are 354, 352, well, forget those, 354. Wait a minute, 354, holy cow. The, the standard deviation on that number is almost as big as the mean, right? Wow. So you see how much mean income can mean, right? Uh, first comment, second comment is, this is, um, I believe the way this is counted is like dollar income. It's not counting if, if a homeless person goes to a pantry or you know, shelter, whatever. It's not <laughs> counting that. So this is income. Uh, a common um, activity would be scrapping. Um, so you know, run around, find recyclables, and put them in a, in a shopping cart and go sell them. You make about 50, 60 bucks a week doing that. Um, so paid work, 44%, money from family and friends. Okay, government benefits. A lot of people are getting government benefits. You know, all of these uh, <coughs> um, different possibilities, food stamps, Medicaid, et cetera. Here's the thing. Um, let's go to alcohol use, almost 40%. Drug use, almost 30%. Mental health problem, 39%. But what that's defined is severe mental health, okay? So that would be primarily uh, three Diseases, those would be um, major depression, clinical depression, okay? um, bipolar, and schizophrenia. Okay? So almost 40% of the population homeless are in that category. And it's not surprising in a certain sense that they're homeless because having those mental illnesses can destroy your relationships with your family, your whole support system. You have no options, you can't work, you're not mentally capable, you don't know how to, you don't, because not only that you don't know how to take care of yourself, you don't want to take care of yourself. Okay. This is a tough, tough situation, um, and there's a lot of issues surrounding this with respect to laws, etc. cetera. Um, the basic law in the United States is if you're, you're let out of a mental institution, if you are not going to, they, they can't prove that you're going to hurt yourself or someone else, you're let out. You're not just let out, you're, you're pushed out. Okay? Um, so, let's look at that. I think one of the things, to give you a sense of where these people are at, relative to the world. So if you take the three, I mentioned this, 367 divided 30 is $12.23 a day. Well, like I said, that's, over, that's higher income than over 80% of the world. Wow. Okay. Um, but they're getting benefits too, though. So they're in a better situation, for sure. Okay. These issues are driving a lot of what's going on, plus <coughs> the loss of jobs. Okay. Um, if you add up the numbers, you can see that it's, it's 20 to 30 percent of people are homeless or temporary homeless and they're, they're, um, they just lost their job and then they're homeless for a little bit. Get back in, you know. Okay, any questions, comments? Yes? So these numbers are for all homeless, not just the chronic? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you'd have to get it. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a mix. Um, and, and, and look, this day, if you start drilling down, the data is, there's a lot of complications. Here's the thing. A lot of people who are mentally ill are drug addicts or alcohol users. 
Why? They're trying to self-medicate. If you're depressed, you drink. Try to make yourself happy because you're so sick of being so depressed and unhappy, for instance, or drugs and a release, you know. Um, so there's all, there's all kinds of very, very messy, complicated issues, okay? Okay. Um, I took a tour of the homeless camps, six homeless camps last year in Columbus area. It is fascinating. <laughs> um, first guy we visited was schizophrenic and uh, wow, tough conditions. Woo! Living in very tough conditions. And uh, this case is just extremely complicated. Um, next, uh, trends in uh, housing and so forth. So the red line here is just um, adults accessing safety net benefits in the oh, plotted versus years, 2007. So in this time period, we've had a very deep recession in the country, and that's what drove that up. But look, I mean, there's some other interesting things like the blue. So the blue is people living doubled up, which you may not be used to that idea, but this is happening all the time. I mean, before you go homeless, you try to find some friends and let you sleep on a couch, right? That's what we're talking about, or your whole family sleep on a couch. Uh, and then, well, there's single person um, households. This is uh, stayed relatively flat, but this has gone up slightly. The um, houses, uh, households headed up by a single uh, adult, um, which is, happen um, more and more. Um, so you, you want to study why is it that people are leaving their houses, okay? Um, why are they sleeping by the river or whatever? Well, I found this, and this helped me a lot to understand. So in, in the <coughs> past five years, median household income has gone down, okay? Stop thinking rich get richer. Start thinking poor get poorer. So that's what's going on. We'll talk about that in a second. So it's gone down, but look, fair market rent has gone up 15%. Median household income has gone down. Ooh, that ain't good, right? That's, a, that's what's one of the drivers. But there's another way to look at it in this plot. So this plot is, is uh, um, let's say, the highest 20% in terms of wealth, income. And then uh, you look at the percent of, the, so the, Highest 20% is making an average of $153,000, okay? And they spend almost 20% of their income on their housing, their mortgage payment, typically, okay? The next 20% um, down is making an average of 72%. They're spending 26% of their income. <coughs> Uh-oh. That means the richer you are, the smaller percent you spend on housing. Makes sense, right? Obviously. The problem is down here, right? Because when you're at $10,000 income, think I'm working at McDonald's, okay, at minimum wage, that's just slightly above that. Then you're spending 87%. Now you're squeezed. Stay in your house. You're really squeezed. Because that little dark blue has got to pay for what? Food? I mean, I mean utilities. Uh, I mean, just your transportation, your car, blah, blah, blah. I mean, this is a huge problem. So that squeeze is what's driving people not to be able to afford housing, okay? Um, next, the poverty line. The way the U.S. defines poverty is the following. We, um, we have an absolute measure. This is different than many places in the world. It's based on <coughs> a government bureaucrats Set about government bureaucrats deciding how much money you need to make it. Okay? And then they chop the line. Now, what they do is, is they say, I'm not going to go through every case here, but almost $12,000 for one person under the age of 65. So that's $36 a day. Okay? They say that's the poverty line. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, you know, three, almost four times the height of 80% of the world. Okay? Uh, and then if you have two or more people, et cetera, it goes up because you have more expenses, obviously. So this example maybe will eliminate some things. Uh, the minimum wage by U.S. law is $7.25 in uh, U.S. The, the Ohio minimum wage is $7.85. Um, if someone worked 40 hours a week for 52 weeks, no breaks, that's an annual income, $15,000 or $41 a day. So guess what? you're just over the poverty line, right? Because there's 41, 
There's 36. You're just over the poverty line. All right, so what does that say? You work at McDonald's, live by yourself, you're just barely over the poverty line. Okay? Uh, the poverty rate in the U.S. <laughs> is hanging around 15% every year. Okay? Uh, you say 15%. Mm. If you're from other countries, you say, wow, that's low. But we're a big country, aren't we? Are we? What's the biggest country in the world population wise? China. What's second? Yeah. 1.4 billion in, in China, 1.3 billion in India. Who's next? US, US 320 million. Yep. Big jump. Okay? But 15% of 320 million, ouch, that's a lot of people. So just think of it for, in rough terms it's 50 million people in the US are below the poverty line. It's a lot of people, right? This is not a trivial issue. <laughs> Some people say, okay, but, and they try to be positive. But then other people say, look, in 2012, children under age 18, their poverty rate, living at home like this, is 21.8%. One of five children in the United States is raised under the poverty line. Oh, huh. that's not sounding as good. Um, so, here's the poverty rate, rate oscillation since 1959 up to 2012 um, in millions. Um, and the, the, the light blue um, bars are recession periods in the United States. They have specific ways to define that. Um, you, you see uh, it going up and down. And you, you, you will generally see there um, <coughs> the blue bar should be viewed as pushing it up. Uh, and, uh, you know, in economic times get better, um, it generally goes down, but there's other factors, such as social support. Uh, poverty rates by age. So, um, so under the age of 18, this, uh, you see the 21.8% happening there, just like on the previous slide, and uh, it goes up and down, oscillates. Um, but what it says, this plot should say to you is, oh, so you're telling me, how does, let me get this right. Uh, I'm a little confused. Oh, no, I see. Um, this, this line at the top is under age 18. The, the 65 and older is the blue line that crosses the other blue line. It's a little hard to see, comes down. Um, that's um, since 1959. Does anybody, can anybody tell me why it's gone so much, down so much by, um, from, from the age 65 and older? Medicare. Exactly. Exactly. That's what brought it down. And the power of the AARP. They're asking me these days if I want to join. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, age 18 to 64 is generally the wealthiest. Next, gender. Sorry, women on average are poorer than men. Okay? 65 and older. You know, you can see the number, 6.6% versus 11%. Okay, so it's almost twice as many women living in poverty as men for 65 and older. Uh, <coughs> in the middle ages, 18 to 64, you see a little bit less of a difference. Under 18, it's almost the same. Okay, because we make boys as fast as we make girls typically, and they're living in families, right? So it's not surprising it's about the same. Okay. Um, Oh, and by the way, I should comment. I think we all know part of the driver here is 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 in the United States at least, women are paid for equal work, not equal pay. I mean, everybody knows that. The data show it. Everything you know, they talked about in the State of the Union. I mean, it, it's it's just true. Whatever's driving that, it's just a fact that that it's happening. Okay, now <coughs> let's look at median household income by race and Hispanic origin from 1967 to 2012. So you, you look at this, um, it's, it, those are dollars on the vertical and year on the horizontal, 59 to 2012. Uh, um, Asians are typically the wealthiest in the United States, um, more than the whites are the next ones down. Um, there's, there's, that might surprise a few people, okay? But all races is there in the middle. And then you have Hispanics um, below the average across there, and then African, um, American or other um, people of color um, 
this is always hard to say. You never know how to say this because there's plenty of people in the United States that are of color that are not African origin, okay? But there you have it. You may not be surprised by that, but that's, that's what's going on. So there's a, some very um, <coughs> clear racial distinctions with respect to income in this country. You do see, however, a general trend up, don't you? Look at, look at the trend. Just I like to try to be optimistic, too. I don't like the split, but I like the trend that there is kind of up some. But this last bit after the recession uh, is hurt everybody, right? Look at the numbers since 2007 or six. You're seeing a decline in everybody's numbers, okay? The whole country. And it puts a country in a funk. Now, this one comes from Economics Policy Institute, which is really a fantastic website. Um, so this is, uh, so it says, ordinary workers have been due a raise for the past decade. So let's look at why. So you'll have a percent change since 2000. So 2000 is baseline, and then the percent increase or percent decrease are plotted for the various cases. And uh, for the 95th percentile, that's the rich, okay? Those are people probably making about 200K. Um, they've had um, an 11% um, raise since uh, 2000, the year 2000. And then uh, the 70th percentile hurt after the recession, only a 2.7% raise since 2000. And then the median has gone down. In other words, there's essentially no change since 2000 for the United States in income, okay? And then the tough one is the last one, 20th percentile, okay, uh, which is a little bit above the poverty line, obviously, because that was 15%, um, has gone down by almost 5%, okay? So what does the plot say to you? Rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That's why politicians are talking about this issue right in the united states this this big you know of course republicans now are blaming obama and saying it all happened because of obama but of course the reality is anybody that knows you look at the data go back it's been happening for about 30 years under democratic and republican administrations don't blame the pol the, the the parties it's there's it's more basic okay it's been happening for 30 years and it's a, in my opinion this is a big problem okay I'm going to have a homework on this inequality issue, and you, you'll see, start to see more about what I mean there. Okay, um, this is a, the minimum wage debate that's going on in the United States right now. Uh, minimum wage, so the green line at the top is the growth of U.S. productivity, which is like, wow. Okay, it's, it, we're becoming more and more productive as a nation. The real wage... <coughs> Average hourly wages in production and non-supervisory worker is almost flat. Okay? It's consistent with the last slide. The real minimum wage, okay, that's federal. States, there's at least 20 states have, have uh, minimum wages that are higher than the federal requirement. Um, and uh, it's 725, like I mentioned, okay? And the, the, the Harkin Miller proposal in Congress says we should go to 9.51. Obama proposed what was it? Ten dollars and ten cents. Other people proposed more. I mean, but everybody argues, oh, it's going to kill jobs. But you know what? There's no evidence that supports that through history. So it, it, that's a baloney argument. So, but you can argue it on other bases, but not don't use the job destroy one because there's no evidence for that. So. Uh, yeah, everybody can take their own position, but you see what's been happening with the law over the years. You see the little peaks that, that it's going down and it goes boop, goes down and goes boop. Why? Well, they don't, you're not decreasing the minimum wage. What you're doing is is you, inflation's eating it away. Okay. So if you look at where we're at now, um, the situation has been worse in the past, right? But. It's not good now because we it's been decreasing and this starts driving the politicians to say, look, we need to fix this problem, we need to bump it up. Okay. So, complicated issue. What's wrong? Is there anything wrong? I don't know. Some people would say, oh, 
I, I once had a, a person from another country say, democracy, it's ridiculous. And, and, and he explains and what people call it is the tyranny of the majority. Who gives a crap about the poor people? I mean, we're all just going to vote to keep us happy. They're 15%. They can't, they don't vote much anyway. Screw it. We're all voting for this stuff. It's fair. That's democracy, the tyranny of the majority. It's a problem with the democratic system, some people feel. They should say, they say, well, poor people should start voting so the politicians will start listening. Oh, yeah, well, then how are you going to get gas for the car? How are you going to get a car in the first place? And so it's a very complicated issue how to, how to address this. The poor aren't a voting block. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're really, it's really a problem. Anybody want to comment before I go on? Yeah. So we have a, a pretty big homeless problem, and a lot of them are mentally ill. Maybe a part of it could be health care. Yeah. And, and it, it, a view, a view, one of the views in, this, in the United States and around the world, you say health care to me, it means everything. When you say health care to a lot of people, it means like everything from here down, right? But mental health is part of health. One of the things that, that, that this idea has been pushed for years by people. Uh, he, I've heard it for years um, from my own wife. She's a psychologist. And they feel like second class citizens as they focus on mental health. Okay, so mental health, physical health, very important issues. Okay, we may need some changes in laws too. I mean, what, what happened, I don't know if you know what deinstitutionalization is, but it happened in, in the 80s. Um, they basically defaulted mental, uh, many mental institutions in the United States and shut them down and pushed them all out. Okay, and they said, well, we'll take care of them with other methods. Well, none of the other methods happened. So there's two places the people, homeless, the mentally ill people ended up. Number one, they ended up down by the river sleeping outside. Number two, they ended up in prison. Very high percentage of mental illness in prison. Why? Because they're doing ridiculous things. I mean, they're hurting people or hurting and whatever, and they throw them in prison. But they don't know what they're doing. So, so this is a very complicated issue. Um, and the reason that it ended, because there were there was a sense and, and there were cases that people were being locked up in mental institutions when they shouldn't have been there. So it became, you know, the ACLU got behind it and said, look, these people have rights. Talk about insane yeah. Okay. So, so, so I, what I'm saying is, is there's, it, it's a very, very complicated issue because everybody was trying, I, I, my sense is everybody was trying to do the right thing and it ended up being a complete screw up. And now, I don't know what to do. You know, I, I, I mean, I don't know what to do. Nobody knows what to do. It's, it's a very, very hard problem to fix. And, you know, it, the thing I'd like you to think about, since many of you are familiar with this, you've seen a, a homeless person and maybe and met them, talked to them, and you realize they're mentally ill. Just think if that person were in another country in the developing world and, and had no support either. It's a very tough situation. Disabilities, mental or physical, are a major problem. Marcia Sen, somebody we're going to talk about later in class, Estimate 600 million people in the world that have severe disabilities, and these are them. This is these are the people at the bottom. Yeah. Um, just kind of on the other side, also, my understanding was that in, in like the insane asylums, the sorts of places you were talking about, they were also performing experiments on these people that they shouldn't have been. Uh, well, uh, yeah. In all sorts of. The, well. Yeah, the problem is, is that the technology, the understanding of mental illness has changed drastically over the years. Back then, they're trying things to help, but yeah, they can hurt people too. I mean, you can look at things the U.S. government's done and testing, you know, various uh, chemical agents on um, citizens of other countries um, and on minorities. I mean, this is, there's all kinds of horrors that have happened, yes. Okay, next. So. How does this compare to the rest of the world? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare to two cases. I want to compare to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Whenever you see OECD, just think rich. Okay, so we'll look at that list. These are the other rich countries. We want to see how good we're, we're doing that. Then I'm going to switch and I'm going to compare a little bit about the rest of the world too. Okay, so here's the first plot coming from the Economic Policy Institute. Um, so what you have here on, on this axis is, is percentage, and on, on this axis we have the countries of the OECD. 
Um, you see them coming down here. They're basically talking about Europe, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Japan, um, and uh, countries like that, the rich countries. Developed world, that sort of defines the developed world. Although most people would include South Korea in the developed world too. So it's not quite the developed world, but close enough. And uh, so these are earnings at the 10th percentile as a share of medium earnings in selected OECD countries. Now I gotta be careful with how they're analyzing this. They don't use the poverty line. In Europe, they do the following. They take the mean in, median or the mean income of, of uh, the whole country, draw a line, and then they define poverty as being below some percentage of the mean. Now you look at that and you say, wait a minute. Are you telling me that if the whole country gets richer, um, poor people can get richer? So in the limit, they can be poor people can be making a whole lot of money. That's true. That's, that's what it says. Okay, that's the way they define it. And almost all those countries do that. So they redefine our poverty line. Guess what? We aren't looking so good. So think of the ten percent bottom. This is percent at ten percent. You know, it's like. Ouch. All those countries are certainly obviously doing better than the United States. Next, well, this is the relative poverty rate. Um, there's the countries again. Um, and uh, you uh, see, um, you know, places you know, like Denmark, Iceland, Slovak, um, Netherlands, etc. And it goes up and up and up. And guess who is in the worst position? Hi. So it's very, it's sort of confusing, isn't it? The richest country in the world, and we've got this much problem. It's because we have a highly unequal society. Okay. Um, next. Child poverty rates. Ouch. Look at this. I mean, remember this number. Okay, now this is a little bit different than the earlier number because the way the calculation is, like I told you, <coughs> but clearly, we're a standout. We're not only just an increment, we're like a jump. Okay? Um, and in some of these countries in the social programs, they have an emphasis on, on uh, benefits for children. We have some of that in the United States called Women's Infants and, Ch Women, Infants and Children, WIC. Okay? It's all over the country. So there is some emphasis like that, but we, uh, we clearly have um, an issue. Now, this one is interesting. So um, let's look at the horizontal axis is social expenditure as a share of GDP in percent. So you take social defined GDP. So it's basically said, saying how much is the country spending on social expenditure. Social expenditure means things like um, health care, um, education, um, social support services for the homeless or you know all that stuff and then the relative property rate um, on um, the vertical and then you put a dot okay and well here we are okay we as a percentage of our GDP spend about the same as Australia the less in Canada there's Ireland Slovakia um, Iceland and yet we have the highest poverty rate. Okay, so we're spending a little, we have a high poverty rate. Then you have somebody, this group down here, okay, this up here, with um, spending a lot and lowering their relative poverty rate. So this shows that social support works, right? <coughs> and then everybody gets pissed off because they look at that pot and they say, yeah, but that requires taxation. You're gonna take money from the rich and you're gonna give it to the poor and everybody starts fighting. Americans, they go out in the parking lot and beat the crap out of each other. This is just very controversial. But it works, right? I mean, this, if you want to help end poverty, you can do things like this. Okay? Um, these are per, there's perceptions, too. I mean, Europe, the, the data I'm showing you, is, it sort of represents a lot of European friends of mine, how they perceive us. Um, I have a question about that. Yes? How do you explain Iceland? Yeah, I have a hard time with that, too. Yeah, it's, isn't that confusing? Yeah. I mean, they're almost spending nothing, but their relative poverty rate um, is, is very low. 
there's only 150,000 people who live in Iceland, and I mean, it statistically isn't necessarily comparable. Oh, I so I mean, you could look at like, if they don't have a very large spread on their income, and they don't, and there's only 150,000 people, like the way that they define these different categories, I, it looks more statistical than like a. I could be, and the other thing is, I'd like to know. I, I forget, you know. I've been reading this, but I, I grabbed this and threw it on the slide. But late two thousands, uh, I don't know what that means. I forget what what that is because you remember Iceland's had a terrible economic problem. Uh, I don't know <coughs> what's happened since then either. Uh, yeah, that whole piece down there. It seems like population density might have something to do with this. You know, USA and Japan are the most densely populated. Kind of like how many resources you have in a given area is limited, and you have to split it up amongst so many people. USA is one of the least in yeah. Well, but that's it. in the middle of the country. There's much less poverty than in the cities as well. That's not true. Rural rural poverty rates are higher than urban pub poverty really? rates. Yeah, because there's less opportunity for jobs. But is well, that, hold on, hold on. This is a, I gotta have you. Maybe you should look at that. Okay, that's the that's. Traditional, per, or, this is a complicated issue you're raising by saying that. That could be, but what do, what do you think? Suburbs of the United States cities or inner city, who's poor? Inner city. Poor by what? Uh, you, income, whatever. Guess what? It is now 50 50. Shocking. I got a homework problem on that. It is shocking what's happening in the United States. Why? Because there's all this gentrification going on downtown and there's all this, well, these people move out and they move in a little apartment and they want to get their kids a great education. So there's this, this go up to Worthington Food Pantry, okay? One of the richest suburbs of Columbus. And look who's coming in and out. They only serve the zip code there. It's amazing. So, so it's, it's sort of like hidden, but 50-50 right now. We just hit it. it was, it's been... Just switching, but yeah, rural urban. Um, the rural typically is have a higher property rate. I don't know the numbers for the United States. It's often hard to define, just like it's hard to define ur urban suburban, right? Because they kind of all blend into each other. But uh, don't have the perception. Don't forget about this perception that the, 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 in the United States almost everybody thinks the problems are downtown. Yeah, it's not like that anymore. Well, I mean, Europe is way more densely populated. No, there's, it I mean, depends I, how you define Europe. Well, like, for instance, Germany, I mean, there's what, the size of New Jersey and they have 50 million yeah. people? Oh, you mean just in terms of spatial density? Yeah, yeah, like ah, person okay. per capita. Yeah, and Japan is much, yeah, much yeah, more Japan dense. Yeah, probably the highest, but. Yeah. Okay, any other? Okay. Um, this plot is to, meant to help you, everybody, compare countries at a broad level. Now, it's a little bit confusing. The first thing to do is to look at the bottom horizontal axis, and it's like 1 through 20. What is that? It's a country ventile. What in the world's a ventile? Okay, it's, it's like a 20% by 20%. Okay? Um, then, look at the, hor uh, the vertical axis. You have percent of world income distribution. Okay, and then the thing to do is to go to the note at the bottom. It says the line drawn at y equals 60, okay, shows the global position of the poorest 5% of the U.S. population. So that line, what they do is they take the U.S. green line at the top, okay, and uh, they say, oh, well, um, it, 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 they go on the green line until it hits, 5% of the U.S. being below that. So those are the poor people in the United States, really at the bottom, okay? So it's, 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 it's worse off than the homeless. I mean, it's really a problem. And then they take that line, they draw it across there, and it intersects with these other lines. What it means is the following. So go over to the first case, Russia. So what it means is, is, is if you go up, 5 means 20. It's 5 times 4, actually, because I need... I'm sorry, five, it's 25. The right to be 100%, 20 times five is 100. So five times five is 25. 
which goes and is roughly where Russia intersects the line. What that means is 25% of the people in Russia are poorer than five, the 5% five at the bottom in the United States. Okay? Brazil, roughly five times 10, 50% of the people in Brazil are poorer than the poorest 5% in the United States. Now, India, don't smile. You're supposed to start crying. I'm kidding. Look at this. I mean, India, so the number actually there hits at 95. So that says 95% of people in India are poorer than the 5% poorest in the United States. That tells you, that's wow, shocking. But the expenditure in India is also much less than what they're, what's their Exactly. Needs. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but, I mean, think about what that means. That's, that's <coughs> shocking. I, I do this, this plot I thought was useful to discuss because there's a good number of U.S. people in here. And sometimes I think we think, you know, it's hard to think relative to the world for us. But this plot says a lot. Right? And it helps you realize, oh my goodness, if I'm going to go to India or I'm going to go to, well, Sub Saharan Africa is clearly wor quite a bit worse than that. <laughs> this is what you're going to see. This is what you're going to be dealing with. Okay? Questions, comments? Uh, there's a homework problem on this that I'm not going to assign, but if you want to investigate this more, this comes out of a report. And um, you, could, you could study it more if you'd like. <coughs> okay. Um, next, there's this uh, idea <coughs> from uh, uh, of intergenerational earnings elasticity. Wow, what a complicated idea. All right, so these are selected OECD countries. And uh, I'm going to just read the first part of the, the little caption. The height of each bar is the extent to which a son's, I think they mean son or daughter, but I'm not, I, I always said sons. Sons' earning levels reflect those of their fathers. In other words, if you make about the same as your dad, you know, you're staying in the same socioeconomic class. That's the idea. So you go over here on the left, you see Australia. So that says, in Australia, that's not the case. In other words, there's not that kind of correlation. In fact, it's typically going up because it's a positive number. So sons are making more than their dads. That means they're advancing, okay? You go to the right of Great Britain and it's a worse situation, okay? And then you see Italy and the United States up in that bunch. So you're not, this represents lack of social mobility. The United States loves to pride itself on everybody can get ahead. Well, if you work, but you, everybody can get ahead, surely. Well, this isn't saying that's happening. In fact, it's just more and more people realizing that's one of our most significant problems um, is, is that we're not, the, you know, how many times have you heard we're the land of opportunity? Well, I've heard that my whole life. You know what? You want to be in the land of opportunity. You want your kids to have opportunity? Move to Norway. Okay? Next, <coughs> persistence in years of schooling. Same idea. Not in money now, but in how many years of schooling you're doing. So uh, lower numbers are, are better numbers. Um, in other words, in, in Denmark on the far left, Great Britain on the far left, um, you, you tend to get more education than your parents. Okay. On the right, unfortunately, we're right up there in the United States. Um, that's really um, not necessarily the case, okay? Um, I think we all know what's happening, though. Um, we'll talk about this a little later. Um, the rich, their kids are getting an equivalent education or better. These are numbers with rich and poor. The poor, uh-uh, okay? They're not, they're not getting ahead. And that's a significant problem. That's everywhere in the United States. Just look at 25 years ago when I arrived here, tuition was much lower. Okay, we were much more accessible. Boom, we go way up. We're shutting out plenty of areas of Ohio from getting an education in Ohio State. No question about it. Everybody knows it. It's just how do you fix that problem? So there's smart, smart people who are not 
don't have the chance to be here because of, of economics. Uh, okay, so you know all this data, all this stuff. It's kind of fun, interesting to talk about. But look, how is it relevant to humanitarian engineering? Okay, so let's talk about that. Uh, there's something called a community technology clinic at Ohio State. <clears throat> the website's uh, shown uh, there. And uh, it has various activities, a lot of involvement from Engineers for Community Service, the one student organization um, in the College of Engineering. Um, and some of the projects that have been done for the homeless is, it, it, there's some things that have been done for heat and light on some things now they're talking about with shelter and a, a get rid of the stupid shopping cart, get a better cart, one that can be easily rolled down by the river, um, is secure, is protected from rain. Uh, Pamela Range, who was in this class last year, she she started designing things. We had contacts, etc. She designed the things shown on the right to help cook. So there's a candle in there. Um, she designed this uh, hanger contraption that folds up <clears throat> and the little um, tin can. You can set a pot on the top and heat your food. She has another version I couldn't get a photo of, but that has a, a better, hotter heat source. Um, there's other things that are going on in computer education. But one of the ideas that uh, we've been pushing is, is to help the helpers. And uh, in other words, you know, there's all kinds of service providers, food pantries, homeless shelters, on and on. What can you do to help them do their job more effectively? Those, people, those places are typically run by social workers, for instance, don't have a lot of technology background. They very much, in my experience, they very much welcome help. Um, so some of the things that have been done is some IT and computer help uh, with computer setup or websites, um, databases. Nice database was designed by a group from ECOS last year. Um, and then some logistics studies. You industrial engineers know what I mean, like Alex, right? Um, logistics. Um, so these are, <coughs> you can do humanitarian engineering in your backyard. You don't have to go to Guatemala. You don't have to go anywhere. We have our issues. We got 50 million poor people. We got 643,000 homeless people. We can do something. Some of those problems are intractable, right? How? It, okay. So let's talk about. Wh you tell me which ones are intractable. What can't we probably do? Yeah. Cure mental illness. Probably not our job. I mean, you might be able to engineer better medicine, but ooh, there's tons of people working that problem. Medical doctors, etc., psychiatrists, so on. That's a huge problem. Going off of that, I know that a lot of homeless people, going back to the mental illness topic, um, a lot of them are off of their medications, and some, some of them by choice. So I think that I don't really think there's anything you can do specifically for that. Agree. Yeah, I agree. Um, this is one of the hardest things for people to understand about mental illness. So get this. Let's say you're depressed. Your clinic is depressed. Do, will you take your meds? No, because everything's hopeless. Nothing will help. Doesn't make any sense to even raise my hand and put something in my mouth. Won't help. Okay, so somebody gets you to take your meds. So you're feeling better. Guess what they do? I'm not taking my meds. I feel great. They're basic. I mean, it's a huge, huge problem. This applies to the uh, other mental illnesses too, that idea. This is very hard for people to understand. It's very hard to fathom that you don't want to take care of yourself, right? That's, that's, or, or don't know how to do that. But if it's your brain, I mean, you know, there's a malfunction. And, and uh, what do you do about it? Okay, other things that maybe we can't. Um, oh, by the way, though, you've got to be careful with what you can do. I think you, we need to brainstorm a little, too. I've got an undergraduate honors thesis project right now. So we, have, we went down to the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction and said, hey, what can we do? This psych Two psychiatrists, social worker in the room. Psychiatrists were brainstorming, and a psychiatrist says, okay, design a web-based app, a web-based program that for people that have tried to commit suicide. So they try to commit suicide, they go to a mental institution, or they go into a hospital, they get released pretty quick because healthcare isn't very good, they get put out in the street, what do they do? They're not well, so they retry, 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 they kill themselves, okay, and they'll succeed, you know? So he said, well, can you design this, this to be a database with a scheduler in it, and we'll give you, uh, and we automate the sending of texts to these people. 
for to help with compliance with meds that maybe would work in less than 20% of the cases because of all the problems okay but you don't just send you send a text to remind them to go to the doctor you send a text to make them feel better you send a text to their friends and family to tell them to call them up and help them you keep this this system of support around them they wanted to do this Shu Ai Wang took on the project he's he's already got a good start on it it's everything seems to be free software wise he's already sending texts from his laptop he can send send me a text to my phone and uh, they, we're not designing, you don't do anything like this in isolation. You work with other people. So they're going to design what's said and how it's said, et cetera. We're just enabling the technology. Yeah. And now that I think about it, it actually thought of something else also. You could, you could do outpatient programs for these people, like free ones that would be good. Yeah. Well, I, I think you're right. So maybe there, that would be a little off. I think the thing is, is I do not want to have an attitude where we say in this room, oh, yeah, we can't do anything with that. You gotta be careful. Because you never know if you talk to the people that really understand the issue, they might say, yes, we can. Okay, so after class, we're going to uh, <coughs> meet up in 260.